during the presentation and we'll have question and answer at the end and then end promptly. Um, Ellen, just a reminder to speak at your microphone so that we don't lose your voice too, okay? All right, I'd like to introduce Ellen who will introduce our presentation for today. Thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Brody, although I think a lot of you know him. Um, I refer to him as the song and dance man because um, he came about a year and a half ago to do a presentation in his three-piece suit. And believe me, it was a three-piece suit, best and all. And we thought he was going to do a presentation on Shakespeare, um, which is one of his areas of expertise. And that did not happen. He did um, song and dance from Broadway shows. And it was an amazing performance. And for those of you who missed it, um, you missed some. Transactional educational mobility and opportunities for German American academic cooperation in partnership. Um, currently, he serves as the Santa Fe representative in the League for Innovation in the, in the Community College and the Florida Council of Instructional Affairs. And he served as a served and is serving as provost and vice president for academic affairs since 2009. So he has an absolutely incredible background and we're very lucky uh, for his consistent involvement in our ILR program. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the proposal and development for formally establishing a Center for Applied Ethics and Humanity at Santa Fe. Um, they've been discussing this project for about over a year and they've had a great deal of positive support from the Santa Fe administration and even a small amount of funding, which we hope will grow from benefactors in the community. Um, this is to be a three-year project for augmenting ethics education and conversations around important ethical topics on the Santa Fe campus and in the community and has increased awareness about the value and potential for this effort. Um, today, Dr. Brody is going to talk a little bit um, about humanities um, and the study of humanities. Um, and, you know, people have said that this is the best, but he quotes um, Matthew Arnold as saying, sometimes the best doesn't mean something else is the worst. And there's a question as who gets to define the best anyway, but from classics to the Harlem residents and from Shakespeare to the GI Bill and the Me Too movement, we're gonna take a look at what studying the humanities might mean today. So with that introduction and also the proposal for this Applied Center for Ethics and Humanities, um, I introduce Dr. Bonnie and I turn the screen over to him. Well, thank you, Ellen. And it's great to be back with uh, all of you. It's my pleasure today to try to say something about the humanities that's in line with your ILR theme this year, which I think is about uh, transformation and about thinking about uh, where do we go from here. Uh, I'll also say this is the first opportunity I've had in a while to feel like I'm part of a, uh, a graduate seminar with two of my colleagues in the room, both of whom mentored me when I was a, a new faculty member at Santa Fe. Um, and uh, um, Anne, uh, Anne Liska, who many of you uh, I trust know, is uh, an art historian who knows far more than I do. And Barbara Oberlander, whom I know you know, uh, is uh, a historian par excellence. And, and both of them have much greater learning than I do in, in what I'm about to, to talk about. But I was trying to think about um, kind of what we do with the community college. How do we in the community college um, vouch for the humanities, keep the humanities going? Uh, I, I have a presentation and uh, so I'm gonna share my screen and go to the presentation. Uh, I think we're going to have, uh, I think we have about an hour. I'll try to keep it going so we can have time for some Q&A afterward. And let's see if I can do this. Ellen, can you tell me what you see on your screen? It has your first screen, the humanities in white. Excellent. Okay. So something that Barbara and Anne and I have all had the experience of, and I know that it's happened for anyone who's been a classroom teacher teaching a required course, is when on the first day of class, students walk in and say, why do we have to take this? Uh, why does the history of the literary and the visual and the performing, of, and the performing arts, why, why do I have to take it? Uh, I'm gonna be an engineer. I'm going to be an accountant. Um, what is it about the humanities that um, uh, makes it required for every student and especially a community college student? For that matter, uh, our, our previous governor in Florida uh, asked why we need any liberal arts degrees. Um, 
do we uh, don't we don't need any more anthropology majors? I I think was was what he said. Uh, are, are the liberal arts or the humanities really necessary for commerce or for for healthcare or for understanding politics? Um, and excuse me, let's see if I can advance this. I'm going to stop sharing here because I want to make sure that I'm going to try again. Okay. Did you see my next slide? Yes, uh, in blue. What is the good yes, line? Very good. Very good. I think most of you know that the University of Florida has such a strong commitment to the liberal arts and to the idea of the humanities that, oh, I'm sorry, it's taking me. I can't touch my screen evidently when I'm presenting online. Okay. Um, that they have required a course called The Good Life. The good life for all undergraduates at the, at the University of Florida, uh, and it and it seems to have something to do with the idea that when we uh, I, I hope you can read this when we can examine relevant works of art, music, literature, history, religion, we can come to some understanding of what's the good life. And it, he even uh, the, the course description even says that. Um, uh, Um, when we when we study um, these disciplines to ask to approach the question, what is the good life? We encounter a treasury of responses. I'm reading the last line. I hope you can see it. The treasury of responses that comprises the cultural and intellectual legacy of world humanity. And uh, so in colleges and universities, we emphasize this importance of understanding how cultural impacts all areas of life. We make every student take a representative course uh, and uh, presumably because we think that these things are meaningful to us. And this has always been true in Western education, especially um, probably because education has been for the privileged. Um, as UF puts it, we're studying the treasure of responses to culture. Uh, this is our legacy, uh, this, the, our world humanities. I think it presumes that we value the humanities. It, it presumes that, um, that this legacy is something that educated people know about. And that uh, part of the goal of being, uh, of being a, providing students with an education is that we're going to be sure that they know what educated people should know. Um, we can approach this from a variety of ways. Um, uh, Wordsworth, um, and I know, Ellen, you're, you're the one who's always on me to, to, to do more poetry, so I brought in some Wordsworth. Uh, Wordsworth uh, talks about the role of the artist or the role of the poet as someone who is always advancing and transmitting and preserving um, what, what has been inherited. Um, and Wordsworth may be talking about nature but he's also talking about poetry. He says, uh, you know, to our descendants, we to them will speak a lasting inspiration, sanctified by reason, blessed by faith. What we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. And that's something that a lot of academics, I think, feel as part of their personal mission, that we're in the position of transmitting something about culture, um, because we love it. Um, we, what, other, what we have loved, we want others to love this as well. Uh, certainly I felt, I have certainly uh, felt that in, in, in my life when I'm trying to engender in students a, a love for the humanities. Um, 
notice that it's not just about love. It's not just about emotions. It's, it's something about the life of the mind, um, that studying the, uh, studying the arts um, engages us on the level of reason, on the level of mind. It, it's not just a, an emotional process, but it's something we can teach to others, something we can preserve within our culture. Um, we instruct uh, we instruct the next generation on on the mind of man, and um, this is an example through poetry. I'm going to go to another example that is often celebrated, although it can certainly be problematized, um, which we're going to do actually. And let's look at this painting. Uh, this is a, a obviously a famous painting, often anthologized in art history books, in uh, history books, in uh, humanities textbooks. Uh, I, and I, I know that many of you know this, uh, Hans Holbein um, was a, uh, I wanna say a, a, a Dutch painter working in the court of Henry VIII. Um, English painters were not as accomplished as the European painters uh, during the early to mid 16th century and, and um, even later. And, um, 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 but Henry VIII wanted to be a humanist. He was a, he, he was a Renaissance man himself, a scholar. Uh, he engaged Holbein, and Holbein here made this uh, wonderful painting of two French diplomats in the court of Henry VIII. Um, uh, the gentleman on the right is a, a bishop. The gentleman on the left is a courtier and the, the ambassador from France. And this, this painting is often regarded as uh, a celebration of the Renaissance man. Uh, here is the Renaissance man shown in all his dignity, shown with, the, um, uh, with all the symbols of his learning. We see the musical instrument, the lute. We see scientific instruments. Uh, this is humanism. This is uh, the gent, this is, uh, I've even read some articles that say, uh, all the symbols here are a reference to the uh, traditional trivium and quadrivium of uh, the traditional classical education. And so um, the painting here is a celebration of, of everything that man can be. Uh, we can look a little closer here and you can see uh, lots of symbols that symbolize, for instance, um, uh, faith and reason. The gentleman on the right I mentioned is a bishop. He's wearing a clerical collar. Uh, we see uh, a sundial. Uh, we see astronomical instruments. The globe on the top shelf, the blue globe on the left of the top shelf is a celestial globe. Uh, the white globe on the bottom shelf is a terrestrial globe, a globe of the earth. There's a lute. There's a hymnal. There's a hymnal on the bottom shelf. Uh, once again, uh, referencing um, a life of faith. Uh, both men, of course, are wearing uh, sumptuous robes. The gentleman on the right, of course, as a cleric, is uh, more conservative. The gentleman on the left is very fancy with satin and velvet. Uh, he's also wearing a medallion of office, and he's carrying a, um, a dagger, a very, a very richly ornamented and possibly ceremonial dagger. So one perspective on the humanities is, is that they're worth teaching because they help celebrate and value what is important. Uh, I uh, Ellen mentioned um, uh, the famous quote from Matthew Arnold that, um, that the study of the liberal arts, study of the humanities preserves the best that has been thought and said. Um, and uh, this is part of an essay by Matthew Arnold, again, where he's advocating for the, the virtues of, of, uh, of education. Uh, in, in the Holbein painting, we see the resolution of faith and reason. Uh, the painting is also a celebration of virtuosity in the arts. Um, there's uh, the level of detail in that painting, and it is a very large painting, is, is tremendous. Um, and so partly what we can do in the humanities and the arts is celebrate the, the technical skills that, that artists and musicians and composers and painters gain through years of advanced training. Um, 
Uh, we value the participation in centuries old genres of literature and sculpture. Um, and not to overlook the obvious, but this is a male pursuit. Everything we've looked at so far from Wordsworth to Matthew Arnold to Holbein, um, um, it's all about manly virtues. And even if we go back to the classics, of course, we go back to the Aeneid and where Virgil is quite clearly talking about the man. He's talking about um, uh, military valor and heroism. Um, as displayed in uh, Aeneas in that case. So is that okay? <laughs> um, is that why we teach the humanities? Uh, we, we just, we want to valorize the past? Of course we do want to, of course we do. Um, but I think in, in line with the idea of transformation, in line with thinking about um, how we have to make education relevant to students that, to the students that are coming to our universities and community colleges, we have to, we, we have to do a few more things to, to, make, uh, to make education in the humanities uh, relevant and responsive to the kinds of questions that our students want to know about. So that when they ask, why do we have to take this class? It's not just about disassociated factoids uh, that relate to, um, as we always say, dead European white guys. Um, so let's think a little bit about how education was changing. I'm gonna take a kind of a long view of this. <clears throat> Back us back to the time that Matthew Arnold was writing in the late 19th century, where education in the West remained a privilege for the upper classes. I know that you guys know that. Um, the educated people are expected to know, especially in the West, their own heritage. They, not that they necessarily knew anything about other people's heritage, but they were expected to know about their own. Um, but that, that, that heritage was getting called into question in a variety of ways. Um, Darwin had raised questions about the natural order of creation. Um, not that it was all naturally ordered, but he posed instead that uh, everything had evolved through a, 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 an ages old process of mutations and natural selection where uh, there's experimentation and things die away and it's all just a matter of random chance what survives and what, um, well, it's not chance, but it's a matter of selection, um, um, which traits um, are selected for and, and who survives. Marx, and by the 19th century, is certainly raising questions about the creation and sustainability of wealth so that those upper classes uh, uh, pursuing education, what's the source of their wealth? Marx is pointing out to the, to the educated elite that their wealth could not exist if they were not extracting value from the labor provided by others. Freud was raising questions about whether we even understand the nature of our own desires, the nature of our own behavior, which, which seems so often irrational. Um, and, and even technology is, is challenging the arts. Um, the camera um, could record history in ways that the arts could not. I am gonna show a couple of photos here just of uh, battleground illustrations, um, because as you know, by the 19th century, photographers like Matthew Brady are beginning to capture um, images that are stark and realistic and the beginnings really of a kind of journalistic approach to photography. Uh, so um, I'm gonna show just a couple battleground illustrations. This is of, of the Civil War. Uh, if you don't wanna see dead bodies, please turn away. And um, I'm gonna show, this is a, again, an illustration from the Civil War. I'm gonna show one more of World War I of the results of trench warfare. And again, um, these are reminders that although the arts are filled with uh, depictions of war and 
um, Virgil may write about arms as a heroic and uh, valor, um, um, a heroic um, enterprise that heroes take part in, um, there's not much that is heroic about the actual battlefield. Um, so the beginnings of kind of transformation of our approach to the humanities we see taking place even in the, in the 1920s and earlier. This is the point at which, and I, we, try to, we try to share this with students, that um, the faith and reason that Wordsworth wrote about, the faith and reason, the best that had been, uh, uh, the, the best that has been thought in the world uh, has failed, uh, failed in World War I. Um, the accomplishments of science uh, from Holbein's uh, uh, scientific instruments to the scientific revolution of the 18th century uh, had just given way to science and technology that could be weaponized. Increasingly, we have the beginnings of obviously atomic theory and Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg are, are, are publishing ideas that even uh, matter isn't as, uh, <laughs> as solid as we think it is. And there's a general sense that the arts are, are too easily um, uh, commodified, uh, the arts. And again, we, we have artists who are breaking away from um, um, the idea that art should be pretty, right? And that uh, paintings are always for sale or for patrons. Now, now, of course, we have artists who are going to begin showing us their vision and their vision is sometimes challenging. Certainly one of the pivotal photographs, and we try to tell students about this, is a, um, a painting by an artist like Picasso, uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. This is even pre-19, uh, this is pre-1914, of course. Picasso is following the post-impressionists and beginning to experiment with, um, um, with style that would be challenging to many viewers, um, experimenting with multiple perspectives, uh, trying to get past the traditional European conventions. Uh, in this case, um, he even incorporates on the two figures on the right, African masks. Uh, so uh, we see here uh, for the first time, not for the first time, but in a very famous and pivotal modern work, um, um, someone, uh, an artist playing with the convention of the odalisque or the, um, the nude, and now they're using African masks, which are now in circulation in Europe, kind of saying, look, there might be other kinds of beauty that we need to learn about. It's not exactly a democratization, so to speak, but it is a realization that the inherited conventions might need to be explored, uh, and that we might be able to expand the idea of what art could be. And this is happening, of course, in every field uh, from Stravinsky and music, um, uh, to innovations in theater and sculpture and so forth. And of course, uh, by the mid-war years, of course, it can be very graphic indeed. Uh, this, of course, is Picasso's famous painting of Guernica, um, uh, his, Picasso's response to the um, bombing of innocent civilians during the Spanish Civil War, and, and again, declaring that art has the power to, um, to expose and to contest um, abuses of power, and, and this is uh, 1937. So, but also in the 1920s, we have a better example of democratization um, and a better example of, of, um, of, of needing to make the arts more responsive to the diversity of experience, especially as it exists in the United States. So in the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance, of course, represents a critical mass of artists and thinkers and public figures um, who were originally, as I understand it, really trying to raise awareness of, of Jim Crow era violence. Um, and these, this was a movement, in addition to being a kind of a, an artistic moment when um, uh, artists could come together uh, to talk about the distinctly African-American experience, uh, distinctly African-American culture. It was also about African-American empowerment and trying to respond to injustices as they continued to exist in law, 
in policy and in implementation of laws. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing here and go back to, let's see, I'm gonna pull up a, a poem that is often taught and that students uh, often get a lot out of if they haven't seen it before. This is Langston Hughes, if I can get to it. Um, Langston Hughes had uh, grown up in North Carolina, but then moved to Columbia University. And in Columbia was, um, as was not uncommon, was often the only, uh, only person of color in his classes. Um, and he wrote a great poem reflecting on this. We have students, uh, often in class, we have students read it out loud. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'm just going to pick up here in the, uh, um, let me ask, um, sorry, can you see the text of the poem? Or are you still seeing my PowerPoint? We can see the text. Thank you. Um, what Hughes is doing in the second stanza of the poem is kind of going to the idea that the diversity of our experience is different, but also the same, but also different. So it's not, he says, it's not easy to know what is true for you or me at 22, my age, but I guess I'm what I feel and see and hear. Harlem, I hear you, hear you, hear me. We too, you, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me. Who? It becomes a meditation on identity. On um, and, and again, this is addressed to his instructor, his professor, um, kind of asking what is the nature of the reality that they share? Uh, what is the nature of, of their difference? He continues uh, to say something about himself. Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me, as I am a part of you, that's American. And so I often share this poem with students because it's a good example of the ways that the canon of the humanities, the canon that we study of literature, um, has to become more responsive to the increasing diversity uh, that we experience in the world, that we experience in the United States especially. Let me stop sharing that and go back to my presentation. And from this point, I want to fast forward to the 1980s. Can you see a slide that says the 1980s? Yeah, we see and the presenter view. We see your next slide as well. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> um, let's see, I may be able to fix it. Can you still see the 1980s? Yes, perfect. Thank you. So continuing to think about how the humanities needed to change, by the 1980s, we've realized an important thing. Um, not only that the content of the humanities needed to change, but also how we approach the humanities needs to change. At this point, 
Um, if you're in university, and that's many of our generation, many of my generation and yours, uh, Western and European culture has entered into catac cataclysmic world wars, not just once, but twice in the 20th century. The Holocaust has represented a failure of Christianity and of the Western tradition's purported foundation on liberal reason. Um, although intellectuals for much of the 20th century looked to Marxism as a revolutionary alternative, it seems that Stalinism and the Cultural Revolution meant that that is, would be no better in practice than, than liberal uh, capitalism. American exceptionalism obviously had been undermined by involvement in war, support for puppet regimes, the civil rights struggle, uh, 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 extermination of Native Americans, and the legacy of European, uh, really Western racism uh, has led to post-colonial struggles across Asia and Africa throughout the developing world. So what is it that we want to still share with students? If we were to go all the way back to Wordsworth or back, back to Matthew Arnold, uh, is there is there faith left to celebrate? Is there can we celebrate reason? Um, do we celebrate American or Western exceptionalism? Certainly, uh, patriarchy is obviously um, um, patriarchy is what's uh, led us to so many of these um, uh, tragedies. Um, it's just a concern, and and then in the postmodern period again, there's the concern that everything would be commercialized. Uh, so I guess in the spirit of transformation, I think we have to be careful to think about when we think about the good life and we think about what we want students to know, we have to be careful to, to not just treat it like we're in a museum. These are works to be valued. Everything is great. Um, but we have to be willing to uh, avoid that kind of valorizing museum approach to the past uh, and acknowledge that the humanities has to be responsive to and acknowledge conflict. Um, this, is, um, this is a change in the way that we teach. It's not what Wordsworth said. It's not just that we're transmitting something, that, that others loved it, we love it, we're gonna show you how. Um, but that we have to acknowledge the conflict. We have to acknowledge um, those accomplishments that were hidden from the West, uh, those accomplishments um, that represent uh, wonderful achievements that uh, were too often not in our, our, our textbooks. Uh, we have to be able to recover and create space for a cultural history of women and minorities, uh, for the enslaved and colonized, um, and so our approach to culture, our approach to the arts, needs to recover histories, stories that may have covered up conflict. So um, it's really a different way of teaching. Sometimes, um, sometimes I call this teaching against the grain. So uh, a student might ask me, so what, what's so great about all these uh, Greeks and Romans? What's so great about the Renaissance? And I, and I say, it's not that it's great, it's that there's something that we can learn from it. Um, the, there, there are questions that are asked in the Renaissance that are still relevant and responsive uh, to our times. Uh, they're also relevant to democratizing forces within higher education. You know, <clears throat> the World War II generation, uh, brought a new audience to higher education. I know, I know that you guys know that um, in terms of education for women, in terms of education for GIs, in terms of the inclusion of minorities, in terms of um, improved access to immigrate to uh, education for immigrants. Um, there's a typo there, it says access to immigration for immigrants. It should be access to education for immigrants, thank you. And, um, uh, and, and again, uh, in all of this, 
we should be, I, I try to present to my students that we're thinking about the humanities, not just in a way that celebrates them, but in a way that, that helps us understand politics and government and civic engagement. And so back to UF, I took a quick trip through some of the syllabi posted at UF and found that this was um, one instructor's version of, uh, of, of, I think, many of the topics he intended to cover. And I see here um, uh, the good life uh, that is going to include, um, I see Martin Luther King. I see what looks to be either Raphael or another Renaissance painter. I see a reference to the Buddha. I see classical painting. Um, I see an example of architecture. I see a woman in, in an African uh, in African clothing. I see a um, I see a fortress that looks like it could be in Florida in the um, 17th or 18th century. And so I think this when I look at this, I say, okay, now this now we're back in the realm of looking like uh, a, a, an approach to the humanities, an approach to um, uh, an approach to essential learning that's recovering not just some kind of antiquated museum view of the arts, uh, but that is going to be more engaged in, in the questions that we continue to ask at, in the present day. So can I still teach the ambassadors? <laughs> And I, I hope you will say, yes, you should still teach the ambassadors. Um, and and I, I probably gave it a very uh, simplistic rundown and a very, uh, maybe a little facile rundown the first time I went through it. Um, I, I'm certainly still going to teach it, uh, but I'm going to try to recover some historical context. I'm gonna ask questions that'll try to make it more relevant to our diverse, say, say Santa Fe's audience of diverse students some 500 years later. And uh, I'm gonna apologize to Ann Liska, who is, as I mentioned, the uh, art historian who I learned from, she's gonna know all this, but uh, many, she was probably there half an hour ago, but I'm gonna go ahead and share with you some of the, the things that art historians have recovered about this painting. Behind the green curtain, and above the gentleman on the left is a partially obscured crucifix. I've blown it up here in this detail. And I think one of the questions that I always want to ask my students is, we're a religious country. We're a religious country in the United States. So many of us go to church. More Americans go to church, go to synagogue, go to the mosque than in uh, any part of Europe at this point. So, so too was uh, Europe in the 1500s. So in such a deeply religious period, why was the crucifix hidden behind a curtain? What is the artist's intention? Why would the artist make that choice to hide the crucifix behind a curtain? Um, is it saying something about whether they had faith, whether they didn't have faith? And there are other interesting details in the painting. Um, on the lute, on the neck of the lute, I don't know if you can make this out. I, I'm afraid I, I'm afraid it would be very difficult. There is a string hanging down from the tuning pegs of the lute. It hangs down um, uh, and it intersects across the table. So when you see the painting close up, and the painting is wall-sized, it's very large, you can see that it's a, it, it looks like it might be a broken string. So why would the artist showing such great attention to detail, you can see the musical notes on the page, why would the artist show us a broken string? The scientific instruments shown on the top shelf uh, are painted in exquisite detail. Um, uh, the details are actually sufficient for historians of science to recover um, uh, not only what the objects were, but how they might have been used. 
the interesting thing is that these instruments uh, are not set in a way that's appropriate for the Northern Hemisphere. There is, um, uh, there is um, the dial, the, the settings um, seemed, seemed not quite appropriate if, if they were going to be used in England or France. And so I might say to students, or I might have to share with students, what else could be possibly be going on in the 1530s? And I, know, and I know that you have much greater cultural literacy than many of our introductory students, but I'll just, so I'll just jump in. Uh, what, we, what I then try to share with students is that obviously it's a, it's a great painting. It's a great painting that shows tremendous virtuosity from, from an, uh, an artist in the, in the 1530s. But if it is um, a great depiction of the Renaissance man, uh, a humanist depiction of all that man could accomplish. It also has references to religious war and the question of the Reformation, especially in the court of Henry VIII. Um, what's going on in the early 1500s? Well, Martin Luther is um, uh, nailing the 39 theses uh, on the door of the church in, uh, is it Geneva? And um, the Reformation is off and running. Uh, certainly Henry himself is in a dispute with the Pope. Why should we care about the rest of the world? It's because the rest of the world has, uh, is about to be terribly exploited and enslaved. Um, and so we, we see that this is in, in some ways a, a picture of, of the dominant power. But then I ask my students, so who's missing? Who's missing from this picture? Well, we don't see any women. It's a world that excludes women. It's a world that is about to exploit um, Africa, Asia, the Americas. And so we shouldn't, we, our, our approach to the humanities in a work like this is one where we're allowed to ask the questions to it that are relevant to us. And, and again, um, it looks like these guys are having a fine time. It's, it's, hey, they're living the good life. They're certainly living the good life. But um, it's, it's a history in which some of us are missing. There's also um, in this painting, I, I, I know that um, some of you will have noticed, there's a shape, sorry, there's a shape here in the foreground of the painting and I, uh, and I, I know that uh, several of you will know what it is. It is a skull, and the painting was a, uh, what's called a memento mori. Uh, when it's viewed from an angle, from the correct angle, you can see that um, uh, the skull um, kind of pops into perspective. Um, it's a, it's um, the reason it, the reason it looks that way is that there's a, uh, uh, the painting was designed to, to be placed um, when it was commissioned. It was designed to be placed in a certain location. And when Holbein finished it, uh, again, the, the memento mori, here's all that you've accomplished, you wonderful courtiers. But remember, someday you're going to die. Um, it was a convention of, of a lot of medieval and, re and Renaissance art. Um, and you can see here on the bottom right how the skull pops into perspective when viewed from a certain uh, oblique, uh, oblique angle. So, um, so what do we mean by the humanities? We certainly want to emphasize the importance of, of understanding how our cultural heritage impacts all areas of life. We want to understand how the history of the literary, visual, and performing arts remain relevant, but we need to avoid nostalgia and idealization and understand that the legacy of the humanities is full of tragedy uh, as well as accomplishments. And both are part of who we are and of what we need to remember. 
this is something that I think is relevant to uh, the elite students at the University of Florida. It's elite, it's, uh, it's relevant to our students at, at Santa Fe College. This kind of perspective really is the foundation for lifelong learning. And so um, uh, when I think about the humanities and, and what our legacy is and, and why we should, why we still need to continue to teach them, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to share. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the chance just to share a few minutes about um, how I continue to, to view the humanities. Uh, Ann Liska and I grew up in the same department, a Department of Arts and Humanities at Santa Fe College. And um, that department is still rolling right along and, and continues to be very popular. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope we have some time for Q&A. Thank you. I, I do see one comment from chat. Would you like me to read it? If you would, I'll appreciate it. OK, it says, isn't the basic goal of teaching the humanities to learn critical thinking so we don't become passive victims of dictators, rapacious capitalism, religious huskers, and more? I think that is definitely an important goal of teaching the humanities. I think um, when we ask the kinds of questions that I was suggesting that we ask, uh, that we kind of look in a clear-eyed way uh, at, our, at our history, we think about uh, what are the sources of information that we have for understanding history. I think um, it does invite us to, to, to think critically. I, I have the misfortune, I think, of being an English major. And uh, I, I do find value in understanding that people who have gone before us have experienced some of the things that we continue to experience. And I think that is shown in, our, in the history of the arts. So I do think there's value in the arts themselves, not only for critical thinking. Um, when you read um, some of our earliest texts, read Gilgamesh, Go back and, and, and read Homer and read about how they experience loss or um, read Shakespeare and what Shakespeare has to say about how is it that all of these things that we, we thought we understood, we don't really understand. Um, what's Hamlet's primary problem? What's Macbeth's primarily pr primary problem? Um, they think they know about the world and, and ultimately the, the plays are just about epistemology. It's the, the plays are about whether we can truly know anything about what we think we know. Um, um, and so I, when I look back at the humanities, of course, I think it's an opportunity for critical thinking. But I, but I do think there's also value in many of the artifacts and, and of themselves. I'm aware that that can undercut some of my argument in some ways. Um, but I think if we are clear about the problems that those artifacts introduce and not just uh, accept, them on, accept them on their own terms, then I think we can accomplish uh, both of those purposes. Hi, Shirley, how are you? <laughs> Hello, Ed. I didn't know Hi. if you remember me or not. Of course, how are you? Well, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm, I'm moving on, but I do appreciate, actually, when kids learn things, it is easier for them to return to them in later life. A lot of that was the emphasis of the Primetime Institute to continue lifelong learning. Once you have been introduced, it's easier. But I think so much of what I am learning, looking, I'm in a Shakespeare study group now of all things. Can you imagine that? And what I can, what I think I see is that there are so many unknowns, so many unanswerable questions in life and over time, we can see all the stories that have been built to fill in the unknowns. And that's Conspiracy 101. So to understand that it's a story to fill in an unknown, don't buy into it. And that makes you question an awful lot of things. And questioning things, questioning authority, I think is one of the nicest things you can do if you want to survive and have a good life. <laughs> 
think thank um, you so much for your presentation. I, thank you. I think that's I think that's right on target, Shirley, and uh, especially. Uh, and it's interesting, both your both your comment and and Richard's comment. Sorry, was it Richard's comment earlier? It was. Uh, are, are are both about learning as a, a means of kind of holding firm against falsehood, against dictators, uh, against uh, commodification of everything. Um, one of the things we continue to learn about at Santa Fe and are trying to figure out whether this belongs uh, more in my, in my old, my and Anne's old department, the humanities department, or in Barbara Oberlander's old department of social sciences is information and media literacy. Too often, uh, the, we as faculty remain very concerned. Students continue to struggle to understand um, the basis for the media they, con they consume. Um, uh, they sometimes struggle with the difference between rhetoric and argument. They struggle with the difference between fallacious argument and valid argument. They may struggle with the, the the idea that anecdote is not enough to make an argument, that there should be data uh, supporting what is true in most cases, not just what's true in one or two cases. Um, and so, um, but certainly the role of humanities in, in promoting an informed civic engagement cannot be underestimated. Well, I think the role of humanities is going to be one of the ways we will battle the unknown of AI and huge data collection that are beyond our comprehension, where humanities will still be within the realm of it. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Ellen, any comments? Um, Ed and I have gone back and forth on the continuing relevance of Shakespeare in today's environment. It's only relevant if you compare it to today and you look at the psychiatric problems that Shakespeare is exposing. Well, I, we, now, we now see a little bit better. I agree with that. Um, but I wonder from Ed's presentation whether he is now of the mindset that Shakespeare is not relevant and should not be taught anymore. There's been too much emphasis on his writings and too many unanswered questions about what he has written. There's even the background story of a woman having written them and the women were not supposed to do that then. So he was able to use them and not use her name. So there's a whole literature about that that we also are studying. But it is relevant and in, in things that have changed only have seemed to have changed. We seem to go down the same paths, maybe with a little different name or a little different structure, but we seem to go down the same paths over and over again because there's a certain human element that draws us to them. I think Peter well, Hyatt is trying to raise a question. I, I saw Peter's hand also. I, I think it was a hand there. Uh, uh, but briefly on Shakespeare, Ellen, I would say that I, I think the approach to Shakespeare in, in my heart of hearts needs to be the same as our approach to something like Holbein. Um, it, it seems clear that Shakespeare, um, he sets up Shylock. He sets up Iago. Uh, he sets up anyone who's a cultural other. Um, he doesn't have, uh, he, there are moments when women characters in Shakespeare's really flash in front of us something that hasn't been seen before, which is an autonomous, um, self-directed, a fully aware um, woman who is able to speak for herself. And we, we see this, um, we see this in um, in Portia, and we see this in um, um, sometimes in Rosalind, uh, certainly in Beatrice, sometimes in the comic characters, but sometimes in the in the histories and tragedies. Um, 
and, and so there are flashes by, by, generally Shakespeare is not generous to women, um, but we, we have flashes that there is something, something different that is, that is coming in my, in my view. So I think our approach to Shakespeare has to be one where, again, we get to ask the questions. We don't accept, at this point, I think one of the things I'm trying to communicate to my students is we're not just consumers of the arts in the terms the arts dictate. Rather, we get to ask the questions that are important to us. So if I'm a woman, if I'm a, if I'm a cultural minority, if I'm a young person, if I'm an older person, um, if I'm a gay person, I get to ask of that artwork or of that text questions that are important to me, and that's okay. And over time, that does revise the canon. Um, it does revise the things that we think continue to be responsive to the big questions. And, and Peter, uh, it looks like you've unmuted, so uh, jump in. Well, my, my question is, sometimes I think that you have a subject that's too big that, that the, you know, a student would have to be a student all their life to assume all you do. Uh, and one of the examples of that I have is, is that, for example, one of the very interesting pieces of, of, of human uh, culture is mathematics. And there are an awful lot of, of, of people who like paintings and so on, who have no idea what mathematics is all about. You know, and, and, and that's, that's another piece of information that should be taught in a class, not of how to solve an equation, but what it is that mathematics achieves. And I, I have another example of, of a, something about the limitations of our humanity. And that is, is when I was courting my first wife, I was dr driving down the streets with her in her, her neighborhood um, in Chicago. And we were looking at all the old houses that were along the, the route that she walked to school and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, bang, in front of me was the Roby House <laughs> by Frank Lloyd Wright. To her, the Roby House was just another old house. To me, it absolutely knocked my, my, off my feet. Um, and what, what I'm saying is in an education is, is in all of her life, I don't think she ever appreciated the architecture of the Roby House. But at the same uh, moment, uh, in my life, in spite of all of the stuff I've tried it, I don't particularly appreciate a lot of the paintings. Part of our education should be what we don't appreciate. I think that's a that's a really good point, Peter. And you know what? Um, I I I guess I focused on the humanities because it's uh, it's where it's where I live, and I also have the and I. I I have many of the same problems that our students have. I'm a Brit lit person. So it's no accident that kind of, I, I, I run home to Wordsworth and I look at the problems in Wordsworth, or I, I, I look at the problems in Shakespeare or, or Holbein because I'm, I, I tend to have a, I'm, I'm very comfortable in thinking about British culture, which I have more, um, more research background in. But I, I'm a poor instructor, for instance, when it comes to understanding, um, for instance, the Asian traditions of, of literature and theater. Uh, I'm a poor instructor when it comes to uh, being able to unpack more about uh, African sculpture um, and, and African history. I'm still trying, to, still trying to learn to incorporate those things. But I, I think some of the same remarks that I made about the humanities and, and the points about critical thinking go to mathematics and science as well. We studied the humanities, this is true, not just because it's, or let, me, let me back away, let, let, me, let me start over. We study science and math, not just because they're useful, right? But because they're ways of looking at the world. So um, uh, they're part of the liberal arts and sciences. Um, and so we have to be able to look at the world through, yes, the lens of the arts, but also the lens of proportion and ratio. Also the lens of scientific method and, and um, Baconian induction and how we know what we know. And so um, I think, I do think some of the, the thing that's different about science and math is that the connections to culture 
are a little, um, they're, they're, they're uh, mathematics I've heard described as the universal language, right? A, a, Every um, scholars from every country in the world can go to the same mathematic ma same mathematics conference, and it's a little bit harder on on the cultural side. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would I would argue that you know um, we teach uh, we don't teach people how to paint so much as we teach people what a painting is all about. But when we go to a math class, we learn we, they're trying to teach mathematics not what mathematics is all about. And I think there's a lot of things that we miss in the education process that would make it so that the Renaissance man or woman would be better educated if they knew more about what these other science and so on and so forth, what these other subjects are about. Even as though, you know, in, in, in my example of the Rovi house, what the proportions of that house are all about, what that means in, in, in the way that we live in the house and so on. Uh, and, and, you know, we're only doing a partial job in our education. You're also right, Peter, that the, whatever I, the, the topic that I chose was much too big and, and I had to, <laughs> had to treat it a little bit, uh, had to treat it a little bit quickly. Sorry about that. I think one of the values of looking at humanities is comparing cultures. You don't understand cultures if you don't have a comparison of them. And we're certainly struggling with trying to improve the culture of our, of our country and our world today, but we would have no comparison if we didn't understand the context of Shakespeare's culture or the context of other cultures that really did not survive and were no good. And we're still struggling with that. Well, if you've got no comparisons, you don't know where you're going. Maybe, maybe Barbara wants to say something. She's unmuted. There you, Barbara. You did, but I'll unmute. Hi, Ed, and thank you for a fascinating um, talk. Really left me with a lot of questions, but I do have one specific one. Uh, what's the trend today across the country in terms of humanities? I have heard that in many colleges, the department no longer exists and uh, is what's happening at the University of Florida common or how would you judge what's happening to humanities today? Uh, that's a great question, Barbara. Um, I think uh, all of you know that higher education in the last, uh, last few decades has tended more towards specialization. And so fields like humanities, the interdisciplinary humanities, um, sometimes uh, I hear comp lit, comparative literature put in this category, um, are, are fields that are sometimes perceived as um, e either, they don't lend themselves to research as, as uh, Peter observed, it, it's just too big. Um, higher, what drives higher education is um, research, publications, grants, um, and um, that lends itself to a lot of specialization. I, I do find that um, in some ways, humanities are offered more frequently at community colleges than at universities. Um, and so universities are more likely to say, you must take a class in literature, in history, in religion, in art, but not necessarily the interdisciplinary humanities. Yeah. I, I do feel like that's been a trend. Yeah, thanks. Great conversation. <laughs> Rick Gold, go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, right now the uh, Florida legislature oh. is debating the Parents' Bill of Rights, which basically says that minors are, are um, under the tutelage of their parents who get to decide how to bring them up in terms of their morals and their values and their religious perspectives. But that's for minors. And we can debate whether that's appropriate and what's the role of schools in terms of, for example, sex education. But by the, by the time the, the kids turn 18, and it's up to other 
parts of their lives to provide uh, moral and, and value leadership. To what degree do you see the community college of, of, of uh, pro, uh, it, um, the role of a community college in, in, uh, in pr providing uh, uh, such support for, for students newly uh, beyond the, the tutelage of their parents? Right, out of the nest. <laughs> um, uh, so that's a, that's a great question, Rick, uh, especially for a community college because as a, as a community college, we accomplish more than one mission as it relates to student pathways. At Santa Fe, about two thirds or three quarters of our students tell us they want to transfer to the university system. And as you know, we do transfer a thousand, over a thousand students a year to the University of Florida, and then many hundreds more to UCF, FSU, USF, and so forth. Um, those students uh, rely on us for a liberal arts education. We provide to them the first 60 credits of their university education. And so those students must have a comprehensive grounding in mathematics, science, social sciences, basic communication skills, the humanities, and, and so forth. As part of that, Rick, I would say that all of our faculty advocate for the values related to those disciplines. And so um, if I teach in the science department, um, I expect that all of our uh, science faculty are gonna advocate for the value of scientific method, of um, the idea that when science comes into culture uh, through something like the CDC or uh, NIH, that it's backed by uh, transparent research, and that we should, um, we should understand that when a public figure makes a pronouncement about healthcare or about science or about uh, climate change, that there's a body of research under, underneath those pronouncements that validate uh, what that is. And it's not really a matter of opinion. <laughs> it's not really a matter of uh, whether you disagree with it or not. Climate change is gonna happen. Um, and so we ignore it and we ignore the insights of science at our own peril. In the same way, um, sociologists, historians, political scientists tell us about the behavior of, of, of countries, of organizations, the insights that come from history. And we ignore those insights again at our peril. Um, uh, and so, I think that the role of community colleges is, is again to advocate for critical thinking, information literacy, good communication skills, scientific method, all of those general education learning outcomes that we associate with um, people having an open mind. We do have to be careful. I think uh, uh, I do think that within higher education there is a perception that we are coercive. There is a perception that we coerce too many students from their values. And I, I think we have to be very careful that we understand that we're not in the business of promoting values. We should be in the business of, of helping students understand how to think about their values. Um, and, I, and I think uh, if we can articulate that, then we will, um, I think we'll be able to kind of defend ourselves in valid ways against people who, who feel that higher education is just a bunch of lefty intellectuals trying to uh, corrupt the youth of today and, and, and so forth. Certainly that's not our intention. And I, and I also think that it is, as a community college, it makes no sense for us either because we're also in the business of supporting industry, uh, we're supporting economic development and workforce development. Uh, we're not in the business of training anarchists uh, or Antifa um, uh, because part of our mission is to be sure that the college is adding value to the community. And that means uh, providing workforce training, providing civic engagement, lifting up communities that are underserved. Um, uh, so I think, I, I, I do think we have to do a better job of telling our story 
that what we're doing is not attacking values, but trying to give every student who comes our way the tools to make their own decisions. Great answer. Thank you, Ron. Any other questions or comments? Well, Dr. Bonahue, I, I know Ellen had to step away, but thank you as always for being with us, one of our favorite presenters. <laughs> and um, we look forward to seeing you all again next week and keep doing the great things at Santa Fe. Thank we you so much. We do appreciate Santa Fe very much. Thank you, Shirley. It's great to see all y'all. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Bye.